Hey everybody, Dr. Stephen here, uh, bringing you another lecture on climate change and global warming. Previously, we had talked about how global warming is real and it's caused by greenhouse gases and the greenhouse effect and humans produce a lot of greenhouse gases. We also talked about how Earth's climate system, the system of winds and ocean currents that circulate heat around the world, all depend on heat. And as we add more heat to the system, it's gonna be kind of unpredictable. So today I wanna to talk about those predictions. How do you predict the unpredictable? Um, we'll talk about some of the predictions that are being made by others uh, and the science of making those predictions. And then as we establish exactly how that's done and the issues there, uh, we will begin analyzing what sorts of effects might we see in the world due to global warming and climate change. So let's get right into these predictions. And oh, we have a subheading today. So we're gonna be talking about predicting climate change, uh, the ways that we might do that. And we will focus our discussion on basically earth energy dynamics and feedback loops. When we're talking about predictions, uh, this is one of my favorite websites to use, the Our World in Data. Data. Uh, it has just tons of data on all kinds of different things. Uh, so anytime I need to pro pull data on you know, fertilizers or land usage or fossil fuels or whatever, I can usually find it on this website. So I really like it. And on their website, they have some different predictions about global warming and greenhouse gas emissions. Some of these predictions I, I see here really got me thinking about, well, how would we even go about predicting such things in the first place? But let me just walk you through this graph first. Uh, what it's saying here is that it's kind of a strange, a um, little bit of a strange graph. Really what this graph is showing is greenhouse gas emissions, so things like carbon dioxide and methane. So here we are with the historical data, uh, and you can see the greenhouse gas emissions were going up and up and up, uh, but are beginning to slow down in the recent decade. Um, and they're attributing that to some of the climate initiatives that have been taken by various governments. Um, just to kind of get some language out of the way, we've had some international agreements on global warming so far. Uh, and generally speaking, they have to do with investing in renewable resources, things that don't cause pollution and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And so different countries kind of say, yes, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna try to uh, pollute less and all that stuff. And so we have these different scenarios where this big red scenario would have been if we just did, hadn't done anything at all. Uh, if we just were like, screw it, we're just gonna keep burning coal, oil and gas like we have been. We're not gonna try to do anything different. Um, we would be heading out on that trajectory. Then we have our current trajectory, which is kind of in this orange, which is that we're going to slow down producing uh, greenhouse gases and burning fossil fuels and all that stuff. Uh, but not that much. We're still gonna burn more and more uh, over time. That's kind of our current path. Um, 2020, we had a little dip in greenhouse gas emissions because of the pandemic. Fewer people were driving, fewer people were flying, uh, but seemingly so far in 2021, things have picked up again. So um, yeah, we're not, really, um, we're not really reducing our pollution much on our current path. Ideally, if all the countries actually did what they were supposed to and, and said they were going to do, we would be on this yellow path. And then if we really got serious and said, let's, let's fix this problem, we could try to get on one of these other paths here where we significantly reduce the amount of carbon dioxide and methane that we're putting in the atmosphere. And then we see the outcome of all these paths. If we just do nothing, we would expect, according to their their modeling, uh, something like 4.1 to 5 or 4.8 degrees Celsius, so 4 to 5 degrees Celsius increase in temperature around the world, and this is uh, by the year 2100. I don't think it says there, but that is what all these are made. Uh, our current track is something like 2.8 to 3.2 degrees um, by 2100. If we do everything that we are currently pledged to do, uh, we would be at something like 2.5 to 2.8 degrees by 2100. And if we took really, really drastic actions, maybe we could stop things at two or 1.5 degrees uh, of warming by 2100. So these scenarios got me 
kind of curious. Well, I was curious, what exactly are they based off of? What is the science of these predictions? And in particular, these bottom ones really did stand out. Uh, 1.5 degrees, if we took really drastic actions and pretty much went down very, very drastically in our greenhouse gas emissions, it was a global effort to stop burning coal, oil, and gas, and a very drastic one. The reason that stood out to me is that if we look at our paleoclimate data that we've already talked about, where we look at how temperature has changed over time and how carbon dioxide concentrations have changed over time and how these two things are very closely related. Currently, we've gone off the chart in terms of carbon dioxide already. And we're actually, this is an old one. We're even above that now. We're at about 417, I think, was the last year's average. So we're, we're just rocking it off the chart here. The idea with this scenario, the best scenario, our 1.5 degrees Celsius scenario, is that we begin consuming way less coal, oil, and gas and all these other damaging practices, and we pretty much stop putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Well, we're still going to be, we're already at 417. So even if we stop polluting, we're going to stay at 417. We've already gone kind of completely off this chart. And I thought it was a bit odd that temperature-wise, they think, yes, we've gone off the chart with CO2, this greenhouse gas that traps heat, but somehow temperature-wise, if we're looking at only 1.5 degrees, this would be two. So 1.5 would be about there. So we're only gonna go up to here, temperature-wise. That kind of stood out because it seems like already with what we've currently done, um, we're, we're likely gonna go, you know, certainly above the last peak uh, of, of temperature that happened about 100,000, 120,000 years ago. So that really made me go like, what is this exactly based off of? Something else that stood out to me about that 1.5, even if we stop, um, currently we're at around one-ish. So if 1950 is kind of our zero, or even 19, uh, you know, if, our zero line here is from 40 to 1970. Um, we have increased by about one degree already in the last 40 years. And so we're saying that if we stop, we're only going to go plus 0 0.5 degrees in 80 years by, tw by 2100. It seemed a little bit fishy. Uh, to me. And then also, if we considered a few years later, before, like, I don't know, 1900 as our zero, we've already debatably gone up 1.5 degrees. So regardless, I was looking at this, and I, I generally like this website, but I was looking at this and I was like, what could this possibly be based off of? And at the bottom of this data set, it says the Climate Action Tracker based off national policies and pledges as of December of 2019. So I did a little research and I was like, what is this climate tracker thing? So I went to the climate tractors website, which is here. This is climateactiontracker.org. And it said that their predictions were based off of a climate model called the magic model. Like, okay, what is the magic model? And so I looked up the magic model. There weren't too many details. You could download it and, and run the model. Uh, and I find some other specifications about the model here. Uh, and ultimately, this is a model that is a mathematical model. Um, and I kind of dug in a little bit more about this modeling um, practice. And you can see it's based off of a whole bunch of math. Uh, and so you plug in a bunch of numbers, and it spits out a temperature change over time um, based off of how much carbon dioxide and methane we're putting in the atmosphere. Oh, okay, um, that's kind of intriguing, but it is a bit confusing. <laughs> and so I kind of want to break down what exactly numbers and parameters are people actually modeling when they make these predictions. And I also want to get a little bit into, okay, how realistic are these predictions?
likely to be. So the entire prediction of these models tends to base around mathematics and physics, uh, which depend on what we call Earth's energy balance. And last semester, I briefly talked about Earth's energy balance when we were talking about energy and the conservation of energy. Uh, but the idea is that we know sun, uh, the Earth is warmed by the sun. So we know that sunlight is hitting us. If it's a nice, bright, sunny day, uh, you know, things get pretty warm on Earth. Um, and last semester, I talked about how Earth is actually emitting its own radiation out into space. Uh, the energy in is sunlight. The energy out is something called infrared radiation or thermal radiation. Uh, if you've ever heard of like thermal goggles or using thermal goggles in a video game or something, um, and you can see heat signatures with them, uh, the same thing is if you were looking at Earth with thermal goggles out in space, you would see that Earth is emitting heat radiation. Um, so, okay, we got sunlight coming in, it's generating heat, and then some of that heat is leaving Earth. That was about where we had left it when we talked about it. And the only additional detail that I've given is that as you add things like CO2 or methane to the atmosphere, it acts as kind of like a blanket and will redirect some of this heat that normally would escape out of, into space back down to Earth. And that's the basis of global warming. Today, we're going to get a little bit more into detail on this process. It is more complex than that. So if we're going to understand predictions for global warming, we need to understand this. <laughs> it looks very complicated, but uh, I'm going to say it's it's not too bad. It's it Once you start kind of reading through it and stuff, it's like, oh, OK, that kind of makes sense. So first off, we have incoming solar radiation. This is where it all starts. We have our sun up here, the sun is shining, and the sun is shining with a certain amount of energy, and the amount of energy that it happens to be shining with is something like 342 watts, which is joules per second per square meter of surface area on Earth. That sounds really complicated, but basically it just means that there is a certain amount of sunlight coming in to Earth, uh, and it's it's kind of got a certain density to it. Um, so if we imagine making a little square that's one meter by one meter, a certain amount of energy is coming through that square to Earth from the sun. So that's our energy in. As it begins hitting Earth's atmosphere, lots and lots of things begin to happen. A lot of it, when this is sunlight, right? This is pure sunlight. And a concept that we're going to be talking about is that basically when sunlight hits a white surface, we say that that energy is actually reflected off of a white surface. You can think of it this way. If you go outside and it's a really hot, sunny day and you're wearing a white T-shirt, you notice that you're a lot cooler than if you're wearing a black T-shirt. That's because your white t-shirt is reflecting the sunlight, whereas your black t-shirt is actually absorbing the sunlight and turning it into heat. Clouds on Earth will actually reflect sunlight. So the sunlight that's shining on the top of a cloud basically gets reflected back out into space. And so that is energy that never even makes it to the surface of the planet. In other words, all of the energy that's reflected by clouds never turns into heat on Earth. And so you can see that clouds actually will cool Earth off. And what you'll notice is that, and I should have switched colors here, the lines that are going out this way are blue, and that blue indicates that these things basically cool Earth off. So in other words, if we took away all the clouds from Earth, Let's say I could snap my fingers, take all the clouds away from Earth. None of the sunlight would be reflected off those clouds. The sunlight, instead of being reflected, if it's not reflected, it's going to keep going. And this 77 extra energy points is going to make it to the surface of Earth, and that's going to cause more heating. So if somehow you took away all the clouds from Earth, Earth would actually get hotter by a significant amount. The same thing happens when it gets to the surface of Earth. 
So this is, again, this is sunlight now. This is sunlight that's making it past the clouds. A portion of that, because Earth is not a perfectly black surface, it's a darker than cloud, but it's not a black surface, a portion of that energy is also reflected out into outer space. And this is basically how reflective the surface of Earth is. So for example, one thing that we will be talking about more is ice. Uh, up, down, up in Greenland and down in Antarctica, basically the North and South Pole, there is a whole bunch of ice. When sunlight hits ice and it's that white color, um, pretty much all of that sunlight just gets reflected back out from Earth, back out into outer space. So if you have a lot of ice on Earth, that white surface kind of acts like a t-shirt and just reflects sunlight off of Earth. If you have something that's more like a black surface, then more of that sunlight is going to be absorbed as heat. So now we can see that we have some energy that is reflected off Earth as uh, from things like ice. We have some energy that's reflected off Earth from things like clouds. And both of those things cool Earth off like, like a white t-shirt would cool you off on a sunny, uh, sunny day. The rest is absorbed by the surface of Earth and the rest, that is actually what turns into heat. So all of the warmth that you currently feel at the surface of the Earth, virtually all of it comes from the sunlight that has made it to you, to the surface that hasn't been reflected by the clouds or the ice. And then, okay, the big question is what happens to that heat? We'll talk about some of that heat goes to what we call evapotranspiration and thermals. Uh, we've talked about how the wind and the rain is all driven, is all produced by heat. So the process of making clouds, evaporating water, making the wind blow, that all takes a lot of energy. So that all basically absorbs heat. Cool. Um, some of this, oh shoot, I forgot about this little guy. Some of this heat is just absorbed directly by the atmosphere as it's shining through. So that's also turning to heat here. So some of it's heat at the surface, some of it's heat up here in the atmosphere. And this sort of reaches a kind of equilibrium where as, as it's generating heat, a huge chunk of that heat begins getting emitted by the earth as infrared radiation. Greenhouse gases basically redirect it back down to earth's surface and a bit of heat basically finally escapes from the earth. And this is what you would see in space if you had thermal goggles on. It's the outgoing heat. And so you can see that the math of this is, uh, well, a little bit complicated. I tried to kind of walk you through as best as I could, but yes, it's even complicated for me. Um, and this is ultimately what these kind of mathematical predictions, when we're talking about these models that I was just talking to you about, and we're talking about these parameters that they're entering in. It has to do with the you know, sunlight coming in, sunlight reflecting, heat being trapped, and all this stuff. This is the this picture is the same basically. It's just not as well done. And the variables, the numbers that we're plugging into all this equation stuff, all has to do with these numbers coming in, the numbers going out, et cetera, et cetera. So these predictions are based off of this overall diagram. And mainly what it's focused on is this greenhouse gas box. The idea is as you add more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, the amount of back radiation that comes back to Earth, instead of being 324, it might be 325. And then it might be 326. And as you have more and more of this back radiation coming down to Earth, basically more heat builds up here. And it's going to build up for a while until eventually it can kind of escape back out into space. Um, but again, the, the heat really needs to build up and the temperature needs to build up before that can happen. So that's kind of the overall approach. And so you can see that based off that approach, if we kind of slow down and stop today, uh, we, could, we could slow Earth's changes down to something like 1.5 or 2 degrees above where we were about 40 years ago, 
if we don't slow down our greenhouse gases and this amount of heat just keeps getting trapped more and more and more, then we're heading to something like three to four to five degrees uh, above where it was in 1970-ish. Um, so you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's pretty overwhelming. Like, okay, I guess that math seems pretty complicated overall, uh, and it is. Uh, but you can kind of see, okay, they've studied the physics and the math of this, and, and this seems like, okay, a, a decent way of maybe predicting of what's going to happen. The problem is there are lots and lots and lots of complications to this diagram, this mathematical diagram of how Earth works, and we're going to walk through a few of those. And the main complication I see with these sort of model predictions is the idea of feedback dynamics. So I'm going to walk you through what positive and negative feedback refer to. They're a little bit complicated at first, but once you start thinking about them, it becomes clearer and clearer. Um, so a positive feedback is basically as something builds up, for example, heat and temperature, it creates conditions that causes it to build up even more. And these are destabilizing forces in the world. Um, so an example of, of positive feedback, we're going to go through a bunch of examples, but a very simple one, if you can imagine a herd of cows, and for whatever random reason, uh, one cow begins running. All right, so you only have one cow running at first. Um, as this one cow begins to run, uh, two other cows begin to notice and that this cow's running and they decide uh oh something wrong i better start running too there could be like a, you know a wolf or something after me and so these two cows now begin to panic and they begin to run and so now all of a sudden we have three cows running and then now that we have three cows running um eight more cows basically see these three cows running and decide to start running so now we have three plus eight and then now that we have eight cows or 11 cows total running now more and more of the herd is picking up on this and uh you know 30 more cows say, oh my god something's wrong eight cows are running 30 cows start running uh, and then now all of a sudden you have thousands of cows running before you know it uh and you gotta you gotta stampede on your hands So you can see how this is a destabilizing force. Basically, the more it grows, the more chaotic it gets. And the more chaotic it gets, the more it grows. And so you go from a nice calm, nice thing happening to chaos and uh, things blow out of control really, really fast with positive feedback. Negative feedback is the opposite. Basically, as something builds up, it tends to slow themselves down. Um, so that would be a stabilizing force. So positive feedback is kind of bad, which is weird that we call it positive feedback. Uh, and negative feedback is kind of good. So don't let that throw you off, but that's sort of what's going on. Uh, an example of negative feedback would be uh, your body. If you're outside jogging, let's say you're a jogger and you start jogging and it's a hot day, uh, what happens is that your body it begins getting hot. It, it exceeds 37 degrees Celsius, which is around 98 degrees Fahrenheit. And as your body gets to 99, 9, uh, 99 to 100 degrees, basically cells in your body, in your skin, and your brain pick up on, hey, I'm no longer at 98 degrees, I'm getting hot. And this triggers uh, some mechanisms in your body that basically cause you to sweat. And the idea is that when you sweat, you get that moisture on your skin. If it's windy outside, you know what the feeling's like when you have wind blowing over your sweaty skin. It, it feels nice and cool. And the idea is that this cools you off. So as your body begins getting hotter and hotter and hotter, it regulates itself to kind of shut down that heat buildup. That is negative feedback. So something that shut, shuts itself off. And Earth has a lot of these. And when you start understanding all these, you realize that this picture becomes unbelievably complicated. <laughs> and we're going to come back to it. So some examples of these feedback cycles are with the water cycle on Earth. So as we are, let's say, so far, 
humans have added greenhouse gases to the earth and the earth is getting warmer because of those greenhouse gases. That's not the only thing that's going to change with earth and the earth's climate and climate system. Uh, for example, as earth gets warmer, more water evaporates and just like sweat cools your body, when the wind blows over the sweat on your body and you feel that nice cool relief on your skin, the same thing kind of happens to the earth. Uh, as earth gets hotter, the water on earth begins to evaporate and that actually takes energy away from the environment. It takes heat away from the environment. So earth kind of begins sweating, <laughs> I guess you could think of it, and that actually will cool earth down. So the hotter earth gets, the more it sweats, the more it sweats, the actually the cooler it gets. So you can see that that is negative feedback. That is a stabilizing force for Earth. So let's kind of include this over to our picture. As we get evaporation, it's kind of like Earth is sweating and that cools Earth down. So the hotter it gets, uh, the cooler Earth will kind of, it'll kind of prevent it from getting too hot, too fast by this kind of sweating action. Uh, also, as more water evaporates, it generates water vapor, which turns into clouds. So we get these nice clouds up here. As So not only is it cooling down because of the sweating action, but these clouds begin forming. These clouds are typically going to be whitish on top. And as you get more clouds on Earth, you're going to reflect sunlight off of you. So this is kind of the, the white t-shirt effect, right, for Earth. And once again, this is also going to help cool off Earth. So as things get hotter, the oceans begin evaporating more. That cools Earth. It's like sweating. Uh, and then as it, more clouds form, that's kind of like a t-shirt forming. So you can see that these two top things, as we begin, begin getting hotter and hotter, these things will help us not get too hot too fast. That's kind of nice. However, there is another issue here. Water vapor is actually a greenhouse gas, kind of like carbon dioxide, believe it or not. It's actually stronger than carbon dioxide and has a bigger effect on the climate. Um, so as you are evaporating water, you are generating molecules of carbon dioxide that are in the atmosphere, and any heat that is radiating from Earth basically gets radiated back down. And so this process serves as a heater. So the big question becomes, okay, so we have two things that are cooling Earth down, but then we have another thing that's heating Earth more. Which one is going to win out in the, in the end? And so far, this isn't entirely resolved, but scientists think that the overall winner is going to be water vapor and the warming. So even though we have these two cooling effects, the one that's actually going to be the most important in terms of how much heat is trapped is going to be this water vapor one. And sure enough, if we look at the amount of water vapor in our atmosphere over time, it is increasing. And again, that is going to increase the amount of heat that is trapped on Earth by the greenhouse effect. So let's talk a little bit about what we just covered. The three variables that we just covered were evapotranspiration. So we are saying that more water is going to be evaporating and that has a cooling effect but we can see that this variable is going to change potentially as we add more heat to the system. We also said that we're going to get more clouds, which are here. And so this variable is also going to change. Those two will serve to cool Earth off. Uh, and then also now this, because water is a greenhouse gas, this is also going to change. And we're not exactly how sure exactly how these numbers are going to pan out. Again, all this is just to show you that as we are trying to calculate and use this mathematics stuff to figure out, okay, exactly how hot is Earth going to get, are we really compensating for these changes? When you read through what exactly is being put into this model, uh, you can see it's going to get more complicated, and I'm not entirely sure if these changes are actually incorporated into this model. But wait, it gets even more complicated. We have some other feedback loops that are pretty interesting uh, involving ice. So the, the last feedback loops were the water cycle that involved evaporation and cloud formation and water vapor. Uh, ice also has the feedback loops. 
I think I've mentioned in the past that the North and South Pole have lots and lots of ice on them, and that this ice uh, serves to reflect heat, uh, reflect sunlight off of Earth's surface, and that prevents it from turning into heat. And so ice on Earth kind of is like uh, the white t-shirt effect as well that clouds generate. Um, so let's talk, there's actually two feedback loops that are currently going on uh, with ice. Uh, the first is that, like evaporation, melting ice also cools down Earth. So imagine if you have a hot, uh, some people don't like to drink their coffee super hot, so they'll put an ice cube in it. The process of melting an ice cube actually cools down things more than, than just the coldness of the ice cube. Uh, actually, to melt ice requires energy, and so the process of melting also um, absorbs heat from the environment. Uh, and you might have learned a little bit about this stuff in chemistry that heat taken away from environment, these are endothermic processes. So these cool things off. So when you go uh, from ice to liquid, it absorbs heat from the environment. And that's kind of just like free, it's like a free heat, heat sink basically. Uh, and then the same thing happens when uh, uh, evaporation happens, it's also a big heat sink. So these processes of melting water and generating more evaporation on earth actually have a massive cooling effect on it. However, after the ice is melted, you no longer have a white surface. So you can imagine that you have a surface of, I think I have a diagram here. Yes. We will be talking about how ice at the North and South Pole is melting very rapidly. So as um, things are heating up, ice is melting. But as ice melts, it's kind of like a big ice cube melting in the uh, the coffee. Uh, this is cooling Earth off. And so that's kind of nice. Thanks. Um, but after the ice is melting, you no longer have ice there. So uh, imagine at one point, this whole area was covered in ice. And it's been melting, melting, melting what you end up going from is a white surface that reflects heat off, reflects sunlight off of your surface. So you're going from like a white t-shirt. As it melts, you're kind of going to the black t-shirt because you just have water there and most of that energy is absorbed. So the ratio is that basically about 90% of sunlight is reflected off of ice, really white ice, and only about 10% is absorbed as heat. Whereas when the ice is melted, now, lots of this heat is absorbed by the ocean and so this is generating a strong heating effect ice is white and reflects sunlight energy as it melts the energy is absorbed as more heat so we can see that there's this this contrast once again where the process of the ice melting will have a cooling effect on the warming earth but once it's already once it's done melted it's going to have a warming effect because that white ice t-shirt is no longer there Okay, so coming back to our energy diagram, we've already seen that the reflected, that the clouds are gonna be changing because of how much water is evaporating. The amount of water evaporating is gonna be changing and then the amount of back radiation from the water vapor is gonna be changing. Uh, but now the ice is also changing. So um, this number, the amount of sunlight that's reflected off the surface of the earth that was dominated by ice, that is, uh, this one's gonna change. And that's changing uh, for the worse. So we'll go red. So this is gonna be, this one's gonna get worse. And then this evapotranspiration, that would also include uh, the latent heat absorption based off of evaporation and melting. So this is changing again. <laughs> okay, so we've already, we're gonna have to change and realize that Four of our variables are going to change, one of them changing two different ways based off two different scenarios. OK, so we can see that this is uh, this math problem is getting very, very complicated because we don't really know how these things are going to change. <laughs> There's another consideration that as ice is melting, it's absorbing heat, but fairly rapidly over time, this ice is melting. Uh, so when we talk about ice on Earth, um, we have two different types. We have land ice and sea ice. Sea ice is just when the ocean gets so cold it freezes, and that happens at the North Pole and the South Pole. 
Uh, land ice is basically when snow falls on a surface and the part of that part of the world is just so cold that it never melt melts and a glacier builds up. Uh, we'll talk about both more here, but for now this graph is showing the amount of sea ice in the world over the last 40 years. And you can see the red line is showing a dramatic decrease in the amount of sea ice. And so far, if we're talking about just the total volume of ice, we can see a massive amount of ice of sea ice has melted in the world in the last 40 years. It's it's kind of breathtaking, but uh, it's something like so. Here we start at we start at about 17, and the unit here is kind of unimaginable. It's thousands of cubic kilometers. Uh, a cubic a kilometer is about half a mile, a little over. Uh, so if you took an ice cube that was half a mile by half a mile by half a mile and took a thousand of those, we started here with 17,000 of those ice cubes. And here where we are today, we're only at about 4,000. So we've lost about 13,000 ice cubes <laughs> that are half a mile by half a mile by half a mile. I think I have a conversion here to how big of a, a ice cube that would be in miles. Man, this is so complicated. Why am I making this so complicated? Yes, I like to. What we're seeing is that basically the oceans are heating up very rapidly. And as the oceans are heating up, it's melting the sea ice. And so we've lost, like I was just saying, that 13,000 uh, cubic kilometers of ice, which is about 3,000 cubic miles of ice. Uh, so Imagine putting 3,000 big O ice cubes in the ocean and think of all that cooling power that those ice cubes have generated in the ocean. Um, so when we look at ocean trends over time for how much temperatures have increased, the overall average ocean has increased somewhere in, in this range globally, something like 0.5 to 0.6. If we look at the Arctic Ocean, the one that where all this ice is melting, we see that it's, yeah, there was one year here that was crazy, but it has not warmed as much, uh, maybe somewhere in this range. And likely this would be much higher had we not had these 3,000 ice cubes floating out there, basically melting to cool off this Arctic Ocean. What happens when the ice cube completely disappears? We are, we can see that we started with 17,000 of these giant ice cubes and now we're down to only 4,000. Uh, within another 10 to 20 years, we're going to be down to zero. We're just not going to have any ice cubes left. So what happens to the ocean when you take away all the ice cubes that have been cooling it down like crazy over the last 50 years? Probably going to warm up like crazy. And when we completely lose all of the ice cubes that are up there, all of this sea ice. Uh, we're going to call that that that's known as the blue ocean event uh, because this is actually what the North Pole will look like in probably about 10 to 20 years. Um, there basically all the ice will have been melted. Our last 4,000 ice cubes will be gone and um, you will actually probably be able to take a boat uh, across the North Pole. Uh, so we might need to revisit some uh, Santa Claus mythology coming up. Uh, we all know that Santa Claus lives at the North Pole, uh, but it's going to be hard to imagine how <laughs> Santa Claus could live at the North Pole in 10 or 20 years because <laughs> it's going to be ocean. Um, so maybe, uh, yeah, I like this cartoon's idea. Uh, maybe we can reinvent, instead of reindeer pulling Santa's sleigh, maybe Santa can become more like a Aquaman character and his sleigh can be pulled by walrus and whales and stuff. <laughs> He'll be an ocean dweller. Or maybe he can move to the South Pole. I don't know. Um, but the big problem here is that this cooling effect that all this ice has had uh, will be gone. And so, so far in this North Pole area, we've had this pretty large cooling effect um, based off all this ice melting, uh, but that's going to be gone. And all we're going to have left is the warming effect. Ooh, plant and forest feedbacks, those are pretty cool. Um, the idea here is that as the Arctic warms up, 
basically as the North Pole gets warmer and warmer and warmer, there are going to be places in the world that were previously frozen that are no longer frozen. They're basically going to be thawed out. Uh, you can imagine um, an area like what's called the tundra. And a tundra is this really, really cold area. It's not quite so cold that it like completely freezes over, uh, but it's too cold for most plants to live there. And we can imagine that as that warms up, plants and also plankton in the oceans that used to be frozen uh, can begin growing. And as we know, plants basically take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And so plants are gonna remove that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, um, which would serve as a cooling effect on Earth. So as more and more of these plants begin to grow, uh, they're gonna suck up more and more of this carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And we are seeing these trends. Uh, we have seen massive increases in the amount of plankton, 400% uh, increase in the amount of plankton, phytoplankton, which are basically ocean plants, uh, growing. Uh, this is the North Pole right here. These red areas represent places where the plankton are growing really, really quickly. Um, where they didn't used to because this whole area of the North Pole used to be sea ice. So this was normally ice, but as it's melting more and more, uh, on the edge of where that ice used to be, we get lots and lots of plankton uh, in those warm waters. Pretty cool. Uh, and those plankton, that's great. They're cleaning up our atmosphere, so they're cooling us down. Uh, however, unfortunately, there's another effect here. As other parts of the world get warmer and warmer and warmer, we get more and more forest fires because the forests are drying out and they're getting hot and hot dry conditions in a forest generate fires. And when you burn all those trees, the opposite is gonna happen. It's gonna add more CO2 to the atmosphere. So the question is, okay, how is this gonna balance out? Are the plankton gonna absorb more of it or are the plants going to generate more uh, CO2 than, than, than the plankton can absorb? Um, that's a big question, unresolved. But here's our trend in forest fires over time. We see overall in the United States, more and more areas are burning each year. Ooh, now we get into permafrost feedback loops. Um, as the Arctic tundra thaws, it is creating a very, very swampy environment. So yes, plants are slowly moving into this swampy environment and eventually it will turn into uh, maybe a new forest or something like that. But in the meantime, it's just this like super swampy area that used to be frozen. And remember, our friends bacteria love these super swampy environments and they are releasing lots and lots of methane. So bacteria begin living in these. As the bacteria begin thriving, they start producing more and more methane in the swamp. So basically this is a swamp that is now existing that used to not exist. And so you can see that the hotter it gets, uh, the more swamps we get, the more swamps we get, the more bacteria we get, the more bacteria we get, the more methane we get, and the more methane we get, the hotter it gets. And it just feedbacks into itself. These swampy areas also are have something, uh, permafrost is what they used to be called. This is a place where the ground actually gets frozen. Um, so it's not so cold that you get something like a glacier where ice builds up over time, uh, but it gets cold enough that most of the year the ground is frozen. But underneath that frozen ground, so you can kind of imagine that this is like a layer of ice at the surface. But underneath that ice, you get to a point where it does thaw and you get kind of soils. And there's bacteria living underneath this ice that is generating methane. But because the soil is frozen, the methane just kind of builds up in the soil underneath the ice. But as the ice thaws, the methane that was trapped there for hundreds and hundreds of years is now released as well. So it's not just the new swampy environment, it's the you're tr you're releasing this swampy stuff <laughs> that's been trapped underneath ice for a long time. Uh, and that's actually what scientists are finding is that if you poke a hole in this ice, you can see how much methane is building up underneath it. And as I, all this ice is melting, all this methane is being released. So this is like hundreds or thousands of years of bacteria 
underneath this ice that has been making methane uh, very, very slowly. Uh, and recently, within the last year or two, um, there are these news stories coming out of these massive craters in the tundra in places like Russia. You can see how big this is. And the scientists were like, what the, what the heck is going on here? And what this was is a enormous pocket of methane that used to be blocked in by ice, but the ice has gotten melted away and it all escaped out in this massive explosion <laughs> of methane. So that's kind of a bad sign. And there's nothing that's, there's no countering cooling effect here. This is just runaway positive feedback. Uh, the more it, uh, it gets hot, the more methane is released. The more methane is released, the hotter it gets. And then the really insane one is um, at the bottom of the ocean, we get these things called methane clathrates or hydrates. It's basically a methane molecule that's kind of stuck in an ice structure and kind of bound up in a, a what we would consider a stable solid. Um, so it's basically frozen in a icy sort of substance and this can sink to the bottom of the ocean over time. And it actually builds up in these big mountains at the bottom of the ocean. And it's stable at cold temperatures. But as you warm up the ocean, these clathrates begin melting and the methane begins getting released from the ocean. Um, when we talk about, OK, so between this locked underneath this permafrost and locked in this ocean as clathrates, how much methane is there actually down there? So yeah, the amount of methane down here that's trapped as clathrates, typically in Arctic environments, so in this uh, really cold ocean environment underneath the sea ice and stuff, but again, as the ocean is warming and the sea ice is warming and melting, it's just going to keep warming more and more. If all these clathrates dissolve, um, our total man-made carbon pollution, so carbon dioxide and methane, we say is about 50 gigatons. Um, all of the methane down there in the bottom of the Arctic Ocean, in the Antarctic Oceans, uh, is something like, so 50 is all of humans each year. It's something like 2,500 gigatons of carbon and another 500 to 1,000 gigatons in the methane uh, underneath the permafrost. Um, so we're talking about something like 70-ish years of our current pollution the worth of methane that is trapped here at the bottom of the ocean and under permafrost. So as these things get heated up, uh, they begin releasing more and more and more. As they release more and more and more, things get heated up more and more and more and they release more and more and more. And so potentially if it all goes, we're talking about an additional 70 years of, of greenhouse gases that aren't even being produced by humans, they're just being produced by uh, the world. So when we, well, we'll conclude today by, by talking about how we have these sort of prediction models and predictor models, um, and they are based off of mathematics calculations of Earth's energy balance. And we have seen that the mathematics of that is already pretty complex, but it's probably not factoring in all these complexities, the natural complexities of Earth uh, that we really don't even understand yet. For example, we've learned that the amount of clouds on Earth is going to change. The amount of ice on Earth is going to change. The amount of evaporation and, and transpiration from trees and the melting of ice, that's going to change. And of course, the amount of greenhouse gases are going to change. Humans are going to keep adding greenhouse gases for the foreseeable future, uh, but water vapor is also going to be an additional greenhouse gas, and we're going to have these feedback loops of methane in the Arctic, forest fires, and some potentially beneficial feedback loops where uh, things like plankton uh, in the Arctic Ocean actually begin absorbing some of these greenhouse gases back. Uh, but 
if I was a scientist in charge of trying to figure out exactly how this is going to shake out, uh, I would really have no clue because there's just too many variables here. So going back to our predictions, this idea that if we stopped and tomorrow and really began reducing the amount of greenhouse gas pollution, um, is that going to account for the additional greenhouse gases that are going to be produced potentially from permafrost or methane clathrates? Are we assuming that those aren't ever going to be much? Currently, they aren't too bad, but uh, certainly from the methane that permafrost is generating, it seems to be increasing exponentially. Um, so even if we stop tomorrow, is the Earth kind of going to take over and begin nudging us up this way. I don't know. So ultimately, what of these predictions is the most likely to happen? And my impression is I, I as we begin talking about climate predictions, it's really, really, really challenging. And it's really complicated as well. My impression is that I would rather not rely on mathematical modeling. You know, that stuff is great and all, but you can begin when you really start getting down into the nitty gritty, you can see this is really complicated and everything is subject to change because we have this really dynamic planet that we live on. And when you start messing with one thing, it messes with something else. And when you mess with something else, it begins messing with something else. And all these things begin changing in ways that I don't know how we could possibly begin predicting them. So what we're going to be talking about for the next lecture is that I would say the best way to predict what's going to happen is to actually look into Earth's past and see what has already happened when we have been in similar climate scenarios and greenhouse gas concentration scenarios. Rather than trying to mathematically solve it, let's just look at what the, own, the existing data of fossils and rocks can actually tell us about how Earth used to look like uh, at different periods of time and so we will revisit the topic of paleoclimatology again. We briefly, just very briefly talked about the idea of ice ages and how we have studied the past climates, uh, but I want to go into a little bit more detail about those things. And so that'll be the next lecture, which will be part two about how can we predict things that are going to happen. All right, until then, see you guys later.